Falchagoo Scott's The Celtic Podcast. Kimraha Huladunya, how is everyone? On today's show in Fekimich Beck and Gallic, that's Let's Try Little Gallic. Lesson 13, asking questions in the past tense. In Celtic history, Declaration of Arbroth. In everyday Celtic ways, Robert the Bruce. We're going to hear music from Cruin. Kathleen McInnes, Dougie McLean, and Bonnie Rideout. April 6th here in a couple days will be National Tartan Day here in America. It commemorates the Declaration of Arbroth and its importance. Here in St. Louis we had a Tartan Day celebration. And it included world-class pipers, renowned Scottish singers, and local bands to keep your foot tapping. But for all that, it's our love of Scotland, our reverence for our tartans, once banned to be worn. And whether it's worn in the fields or a formal gathering, it's really about a drink with friends. Even a wayward hound. And passing all these things on to future generations. Learn the history of Gaelic songs as you learn to sing them. Gaelic and English lyrics are provided to give you a deeper understanding of the song, to guide you when you're learning, or just sit back and enjoy these beautiful songs. Welcome to Learn a Gaelic Song. Today's song is Horo Movata. Uh, this song is about a boat, a coracle to be exact, which is a small wicker craft that, which hides stretched over it and it is usually propelled only with a paddle. Now the coracle dates back to the first century BC and began as a personal craft for fishing local waterways. Now over time the boats became larger and incorporated sails in order to reach um, further out into the sea for better fishing. Now this type of craft could be on the seas for days. And this fisherman in this song goes west and promises to return on St. John's feast day, which of course is June 24th. Alright, enjoy the song and remember... Gallic at the top, English at the bottom. Get ready. Oh 
Celtic history brings you the tales of the land, castles, warriors, heroes, legends, and customs that have created the rich, vibrant, and sometimes strange and wonderful history of the Celtic world. For as long as but a hundred of us remain alive, never will we on any conditions be brought under English rule. It is in truth not for glory, nor riches, nor honors that we're fighting, but for freedom, for that, alone, which no honest man gives up but with life itself. Today's topic is the Declaration of Arbroath. How it was not the first declaration. This April 6th we celebrated the anniversary of the Declaration of Arbroath. But the English claim to Ireland has always been contentious. You know, and as you're sitting there saying, what does that have to do with Scotland declaring independence? Well, as a noted journalist complained, now let the envious and the thoughtless end of vociferous complaints that the kings of England hold Ireland unlawfully, as rule over Ireland had been offered to the Plantagenet Nets by a papal bull order called Lauderbilter in 1155. Now Edward, so this is Edward the Bruce, yeah, brother of uh, Robert the Bruce, uh, in later years got with Donald O'Neill and sent a remonstrance, which is this basically the same thing as a declaration to Pope John 22nd in 1317. This asked for Lauderbilter, which was back in 1155, to be revoked and informed the Pope that they had chosen Edward as their king. Now remember, this is 1317, three years before the Declaration of Arbroath. The remonstrance rejection of the claim was sent to uh, Pope John the 22nd by Donald O'Neill of the Kinal Egan line of the Northern O'Neills. The remonstrance describes Donald as King of Ulster and by hereditary right the true heir to the whole of Ireland. Now Donald claims the support of the Irish elite and people, calls for papal backing against the English rule, and offers the kingship of Ireland to Edward the Bruce of Scotland. The remonstrance's timing and link with Scotland are crucial. In 1314 at Bannockburn, Edward the Bruce's brother Robert, the Scottish king, halted Edward II of England's attempt to conquer Scotland, as we all know. Earlier, Robert de Bruce wrote to the Irish, emphasizing their shared ancestry, language, and customs, the medieval definition of nationhood, and urging cooperation in, to regain our nation's ancient freedom. Now, Edward Bruce landed in Ireland in 1315, and Donald joined his campaign. The remonstrance echoes Robert's letter and represents the Scots and Irish as one nation. Now, the kings of Lesser Scotia, which is Scotland, have all traced their ancestral origin to our Greater Scotia, which is Ireland, retaining our language and habits to some extent. Now, the real intent of Robert de Bruce, and of course Edward de Bruce, was to stop Ireland from being a ready source of soldiers for the English every time they wanted to go to war against the French or, or of course, the Scottish. And to move on from there, despite fawning over Edward de Bruce and the Remonstrance, which it does very well, the papacy neither recognized Edward's claim nor agreed with the Remonstrance, and his rule remained only over parts of Ireland and never over the whole island. Then, in the late summer of 1318, Sir John de Birmingham, with his army, began to march against Edward de Bruce, and on the 14th of October 1318, the Scots-Irish army was badly defeated at the Battle of Foggart by, of course, Birmingham's forces. Now, Edward was killed there, and his body was quartered and sent to the various towns in Ireland as a warning, of course, and his head was delivered to Edward, King Edward II, that is. Robert de Bruce 
of course, had been in exile from Edward II, but returned to Scotland. Robert waged a highly successful guerrilla war against the English. At the Battle of Bannockburn in June of 1314, he defeated a much larger English army under Edward II, confirming the reestablishment of an independent Scottish monarchy. Now, with Robert's help in 1316, his brother Edward de Bruce was inaugurated as High King of Ireland, but, as we said earlier, was killed. Even after Bannockburn and the Scottish capture of Berwick in 1318, Edward II refused to give up his claim to the overship of Scotland. Some believe, having been emboldened by the defeat of Edward at Fogart. So in 1320, the Scottish earls, barons, and the community of the realm sent a letter similar to that of the failed remonstrance of the princes to Pope John XXII, declaring that Robert was their rightful monarch. Now this was the Declaration of Arbroath, and it asserted the antiquity of the um, Scottish people and their monarchy. Four years later, Robert de Bruce received the papal recognition as King of an Independent Scotland, and the Franco-Scottish alliance was renewed in the Treaty of Corbel. The Treaty of Corbel in 1326 renewed the old alliance, which was for back from 1295. And the old now the old alliance was an alliance between the kingdoms of Scotland and France. It was designed by the Pope for the purpose of controlling England's numerous invasions. It confirmed the obligation of each state to join the other in declaring war if it was ever attacked by England. <laughs> and, and in 1327, the English deposed Edward II in favor of his son, and peace was finally made with Scotland.
Everyday Celtic Ways brings you the mythology, traditions, and customs that have created a unique and personal culture that still affects those that are Celtic and those that just love the Celtic world. Celtic Badass of the Week showcases a different badass person of Celtic heritage each week. Those who exemplify the give-no-shit attitude and come on on top. They may come from our past or our present, but rest assured they come from all walks of life and legend. They are men, women, even old ladies and pirate queens. You don't have to be a muscled up Celt in a fur kilt swinging a mighty sword. You can just be a 4 foot 11 Welsh woman and suffragette who knows jujitsu. Most of these badasses are all too real. While some may be only legend, badass legends though. The only prerequisite for this title it's Celtic blood and badassedness. This week's Celtic badass, Robert the Bruce. The King of Scotland, Robert the Bruce, was a badass mother who eventually took his head out of his own ass and inspired by William the Wallace, an even badasserer mother, and an unnamed spider, won independence for Scotland. Now, it's claimed that Robert the Bruce hit out like a little bitch, deposed, after his disastrous first year as King of Scots. Legend tells us that, while waiting out the winter in 1306 in a cave, he watched the spider on the cave wall try time and again to spin its web. Every time the spider fell, it rose to begin again, ever vigilant and persistent to complete the task at hand. Bruce took this to be an omen and resolved to get, to get his badassery back on. Now, Bruce had had paid homage to Edward I of England in the past, mainly due to family allegiance and to enrich his name with lands and titles. But much like his father had done before him, and it's, it's not known why he changed his allegiance later, but it has been thought that the romance surrounding William Wallace's fight for independence showed him the true plight of his country. And if a commoner could rise to such badassery and accomplish so much for the cause of freedom, then that should be his true path. In 1306, in the Greyfriars Church at Dumfries, he met with his rival for the throne to hash out a compromise. So when that bastard attacked him with a hidden sword, he murdered his only possible rival for the throne, John Common. But for his trouble, he was excommunicated for the sacrilege, you know, killing someone in church, that's a bad thing. Nevertheless, he was crowned King of Scotland just a few months later. Robert de Bruce was defeated in his first two battles against the English and became a fugitive, hunted by both common friends and the English. Robert de Bruce was a battlefield badass. He warred treacherously with his political opponents, fought off foes in Northern England and Ireland, and won a historic victory over Edward II's army at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. Robert, he had defeated a much larger English army under Edward II of England, confirming the reestablishment of the independent Scottish Kingdom. Now, the battle marked a significant turning point, with Robert's army is now free to launch devastating raids throughout northern England. Now, while also extending his war against the English to Ireland by sending his, you know, dunce of a brother Edward to uh, invade there and by appealing to the Irish to rise up against Edward II's rule. Now, despite Bannockburn and the capture of the final English stronghold at Berwick with Black Douglas in 1318, that bastard Edward II refused to announce his claim on the overlordship of Scotland. So they resorted to the nuclear option. Whoa, man, what could it be? Well, they penned a stern letter to the Pope. In 1320, the Scottish nobility submitted the Declaration of Arbroath to Pope John XXII, declaring Robert as their rightful monarch and asserting Scotland's status as an independent kingdom. In 1324, despite having excommunicated Robert the Bruce, the Pope, well, he recognized Robert I as king of an independent Scotland, basically because England was getting weaker and Scotland was getting stronger. And in 1320, he did that in 1326. The following year, the English deposed Edward II in favor of his son, Edward III. 
and peace was concluded between Scotland and England with the Treaty of Edinburgh, Northampton in 1328, by which Edward III renounced all claims to sovereignty over Scotland. Bruce was King of Scotland from 1306 to 1329. Robert de Bruce, he is buried in Dumfrieline Abbey, and he is attributed to have said the following most badass quote ever. We fight not for glory, nor wealth, nor honor, but only and alone for freedom, which no good man surrenders but with his life. Damn. Robert de Bruce, badass. Deep 
departed joys, departed never to return. Scottish Gaelic is native to the Gales of Scotland. Scottish Gaelic developed out of the Old Irish, and learning this beautiful language can be a direct link to your Gaelic ancestors. Follow along in Fekimich Beckham Gaelic, and like I said, let's try a little Gaelic. Fauchagu, ye old Scots, introduction to Scottish Gaelic. Camera ha hula dunya, how is everyone? All right, check it out. You already know how to say, Welcome to and how is everyone? Now please remember that I am not an authority on the Gallic language, I just love learning it and want to pass it on to you. What I present comes from well-respected Gallic teachers, so I hope you will find it interesting, informative, and fun. And as always, I display everything on the screen so you can follow along. Kersh Maha! Alright then, get ready! We're in lesson 13 and it's asking questions in the past tense. And one of the most important things you can learn is to how to recognize the tenses quickly. All too often, this is what causes us learners to pause when we are reading or listening to Gaelic and makes us look foolish when we're talking to somebody who speaks Gaelic better than we do. So, um, yeah, just figure out what the tenses look like, recognize them immediately, and you'll be good to go. All right, questions. We're going to work on these question words. Ko, which means who. Ko va shin, who was there. Ko va ak and doris, who was at the door. Kimmer, which is how. Kimmer va a, how was he. All right, kun, which is when. Kun va E a chien. When was she coming? All right. J, which is what? J va u a janif. What were you doing? Kovit. How many? Now this is sometimes spelled kiviet, but you don't see that as often as you used to. Kovit ku ava akit. How many dog were at you? All right, Carson, why? Carson of A and cat and show. Why was the cat here? All right, now the last one is catcha and beware. It's because catcha will always be different. Catcha, which is where, as we said. Catcha and ro and dunya. Where was the man? Catcha and ro and dunya shin. Where was that man? All right, now we're going to move on to some vocabulary. Uh, and Doris, the door. A chin, coming. A dole, going. A janev, doing or making. And unyuk, the window. Fosklicha, open. Dun, closed. And dunya, the man. Ku, dog, cat, cat. All right. And that's like a, we do it at the end of every uh, lesson. We got six uh, senses here for you to translate. And the first one is Kimranavashiv. Two, Kova Akandoris. Three, Kunava Iat Achian. Four, Jayava Uajanev. Five, 
Anro Ak and Unik. 6. Karsinava and Doris Foskelcha. 